Let's pray. O Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, bought and brought back through the blood of Jesus Christ and through his resurrection given eternal life. Grace and peace to you. They say that when the Roman army would venture forth into some new land to conquer, their commanders would burn the bridges that the troops crossed behind them so that the troops would know there's no going back. You gotta fight hard. They say that Hernan Cortez, the Spanish conquistador, when he landed in Mexico to conquer the Aztecs, did much the same thing. Burnt his ships so his troops would know they were fighting for their lives. I didn't realize until I was doing a little research on the idiom this week that that idiom, burning bridges, can actually be used in a positive way. I read a couple articles about people suggesting that sometimes you need to burn bridges. You need to cut off you know, some person or some situation in your life that's holding you back so you can move forward. So you know there's no returning like those troops. But of course, that can backfire. I mean, what if the Roman army starts getting whipped and they have nowhere to go. It turns into a massacre. Same with the Spanish troops, and it can be the same in our lives. I wonder if the Jews that Peter preached to on, on this day felt about God that way. Look what he says to them. God glorified his servant Jesus, the same God that you rejected, betrayed, and killed and denied. Even Pilate, a pagan unbeliever, did better than you, he says, because he was trying to release him. He knew that he was innocent, but you killed him, the author of life, and God raised him from the dead. Doesn't that seem like a bit of a, uh-oh? Have you ever, imagine, I almost said have you ever, and I'm sure you haven't. Imagine that you killed someone, and then that person came back to life. Not just a ghost, that'd be scary enough, but actually came back to life. It would be terrifying, right? You'd think that person would want revenge. But I don't think that even begins to cover the terror that the news of Jesus' resurrection must have initially been to these people who had killed him. And they couldn't deny it. The proof was in front of them. It says in our text, they all gathered together to Peter and John, and they were astounded. They were flabbergasted. I think that's the best English word to communicate what the text is saying. They were astounded, and they must have been terrified. This guy in front of them, they all knew him. He was there every day at the temple, and he had been lame from birth. And all of a sudden, he's standing up. It says he's clinging to Peter and John, not because he needs their support. Just a second ago, he'd been leaping and dancing and praising God. He's clinging to them because they won't let go. And Peter says, we didn't do this. Jesus did this. Here's the proof that Jesus is alive, the one that you killed. Wouldn't that seem like the biggest burned bridge of all time? God sent you his son. And you killed him. He sent you your savior. And you crucified him. He sent you your king. And you rejected him. Perhaps sometimes a person who has fallen into some great sin and shame could feel this way. I've gone too far. I've sinned too much. I've burned that bridge to God. There's no going back. There's no retreat. You know, you sometimes hear people joke along those lines. I don't know if you've ever heard this, but I've, I've heard people talk like this. You know, oh... I'm too far gone. I'm going straight to hell. And they're joking, but you can tell. Right? People don't joke about that sort of thing unless they're also partly afraid of it. And that's because they think of their relationship with God in terms of works. And they realize that they've sinned, and they don't think there's any hope for them, so they figure, what's the point? There's, you know, burn bridge. Might as well go forward. Might as well sin as much as I can. While I'm here, might as well have some fun. Do you ever have an attitude like that? Perhaps we think at times after giving in to some temptation, well, there's no going back now. I already crossed the bridge. I might as well go on and sin all the way. Or maybe conversely, we're being tempted by something and we think, well, I can always repent later. I might as well go ahead and sin now. And while that statement is true in one context, right, I can repent later, it's true in one sense, it's entirely false when it is used as an excuse to sin. That's not the voice of God, but the voice of the devil. That's not a message of grace, but a twisting of scripture to lead us away from Christ. See, of course, after the law strikes you and you feel the guilt of your sin, then the devil changes his tune. Now he says, oh, look what you did. No hope for you. There's no retreat. There's no repentance. God doesn't want you. You burned that bridge. 
It's one of the devil's favorite tricks, to, to twist the Bible, to give us the parts that are the opposite of what we need. So he preaches the gospel to us when we need the law, and he preaches the law to us when we need the gospel. So if you're sitting there and you're being tempted and, and you're thinking about sinning, he says, oh, you know, Jesus is your savior. He forgives sins, so you can always repent later. That's a manipulation. That's a denial of grace. That's an act of unbelief to sin because we think we'll be forgiven later. But then when we're crushed by our guilt, Satan comes along and he says, oh, that gospel's not for you. You sinned. It doesn't apply to you. You've burned that bridge. He's like Scar from The Lion King. You know, he convinces Simba that it's his fault his dad has died. Tells him everybody's going to blame him. Says, you've got to run away. You've burned that bridge. Never come back. It's the way the devil treats us. The devil would like to preach Christ's resurrection to us in that way. He would have said to those Jews that Peter was preaching to, he would have said, look, you killed him, and now he's alive. You're in trouble. You're going to get it. He's going to want revenge. Look, he's powerful. Look, you were wrong. Look, God is saying you were wrong because he's alive. And he could say it to you too. He could say, look how many times you've chosen something else instead of Christ. And he'd be right. When we put something in our lives above Jesus, it is us as much as anyone else who is nailing him to the cross. We are rejecting and denying him. They asked for a murderer instead of their king. And how often have you and I asked for something else instead of Jesus? Maybe the freedom to do whatever you feel like doing, the love and friendship of the world, money. Well, the devil says, you've burned that bridge. No going back. But that's a lie. Peter does not preach the resurrection as law. He doesn't say God raised him from the dead in order to terrify them, but in order to comfort them. He condemns them for their rejection of Christ, their denial of him, for killing him. But when he preaches the resurrection, he says, repent, therefore, and turn back. He's saying, retreat. The bridge is not burned because Jesus is alive. When God raised Jesus, he was doing more than saying, you're wrong. He was saying, I have made your wrongs right. He was undoing their crime. He was rebuilding the bridge that they had burned. And that bridge is his son. He is the way and the truth and the life. He is the mediator between God and man. When you're tempted to sin and think, oh, might as well keep going because there's no going back now. Christ says, no, stop, turn, repent. And when you're tempted to think, well, I can always repent later. Christ says, no, stop, turn, repent. And when you're struck with your guilt and the devil says, well, there's no going back. The bridge is burnt. Christ says, no, I am here. I am always here. Turn, repent. For Christ is risen. And that means he has become an unburnable bridge by which we may always retreat in repentance and by which our sins can be blotted out. See, I mentioned that I didn't realize there was a positive sense of the idiom burning bridges, but I think we're all familiar with the negative sense. You know, usually it's done out of pride. Like, maybe you find some new cool kids to hang out with, and so you leave your old friends behind because you think they're lame or you think they'll hold you back. And later you find out that the cool kids weren't so cool or nice as you thought, and you wish you had your old friend back. Or maybe you, you think you got a new job lined up, but it's going to be way better you're so sick of your old job, and so you quit. But when you quit, you're rude, and you're inconsiderate, and you don't give two weeks of notice. I knew somebody who did this once. They quit the job, and they give two weeks notice. I'm like, why? They're never going to take you back. I don't need that job anymore. But what if you do? What if the new job falls through, and you need the old one again, and you can't, because you've burned that bridge? Think in this context of the Israelites Peter is addressing. He convicts them of their sin. And the sin they've committed is killing the Savior God had sent to them. I mean, again, how, how are you supposed to be forgiven for that? That's what human reason would say. You've burned that bridge. But as we noted, God raised Jesus. And notice the contrast that Peter draws, both to convict them of their sin and to comfort them with their Savior. First, he says, God glorified his servant Jesus. And you rejected and denied him, right? You were ashamed of him. You didn't want him. God glorified him. And he's talking about the same thing. He says, when you guys crucified Jesus, 
You were denying him. You did that because you didn't want him, because you were ashamed of him. But when he says God glorified his servant Jesus, he is talking about his crucifixion and his resurrection. Right before Jesus was to be crucified, he said, now is the hour come for the Son of Man to be glorified. His death was a glorification. His humility was his glory. For by it, he was showing his great love for the world. By it, God was showing us exactly the power and strength of his love to save. And those two things, the death and the resurrection, they're, they're one. In them, God was glorifying his servant. While the Jews were rejecting him, ashamed of him. The second contrast, he says, is you killed him, God raised him from the dead. That's a pretty big contrast. You killed him, God raised him. And thirdly, he says, you did it in ignorance. And that's, that's both like saying, okay, it's not as bad as it could be, because at least you didn't realize what you're doing, but it's also another conviction of sin. Their ignorance was sin. There was no excuse for them not knowing who Jesus was. He'd made it very plain to them. They had the scriptures. But then he turns around and says, you did it in ignorance, but God thus fulfilled what he foretold through the mouth of all of his holy prophets. In other words, he's saying, what you guys did was terrible and evil and sinful and wrong. But through it, God was working your salvation. You didn't know what you were doing, but God did. By this, God was sending his son to willingly sacrifice himself for you, to become your mediator so that your sins might be forgiven, so that they might be blotted out. That word blotted out, it means erased, as if it never happened at all. You know, think of it this way. Their crime was killing Jesus, right? And then God raised him from the dead. Let's say that Craig was accused of killing Carly. And he gets you know, brought up on charges before the judge. And the day that he's brought up on charges before the judge, Carly comes and stands in the courtroom, says, um, I'm here. All charges are going to be dropped immediately, right? You can't have a crime when, of killing Carly when Carly is still alive. Well, that's what Peter is saying to these Jews. Your crime is gone. You killed Jesus, but he's alive. So there is no guilt if you believe in his name. And that's true of all of our sins. For on the cross, Jesus bore all of our sins, and it was you and me as much as anyone else who crucified him. Therefore, when he rose, it was a blotting out of all sin. It is as if every single sin you've ever sinned never even happened. Because Christ has justified the world. And we receive this through faith. Notice how Peter emphasizes faith in our text. He says, this man who's before you, he has been healed by the name of Jesus. He says, his name, by faith in his name, has made this man well. And then he says, this faith, which is through Jesus, has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. What he means is this, that the power was Christ's, that it was done in the authority and the name of Jesus, and by the power of Peter, and that it was done through faith. See, God had promised the apostles, Jesus had promised the apostles that they would have the power from him to heal and do miracles in order to prove that their word was true. So when Peter did this miracle, he was laying hold of that promise. Therefore, through faith, the man was healed, through the faith of Peter. And that faith, Peter says, is what is through Jesus. And this man, too, undoubtedly, Peter is saying, has faith in what Peter has said to him in the promise of Christ. Now, you and I have not been promised the authority or the power to heal people or to do miracles. If we tried to do that, it would not be an act of faith but of unbelief because we'd be ignoring what Christ has told us. But we have been given a greater promise. We have been given the promise of the blotting out of our sins through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is a much greater power and authority which gives us a wholeness of soul which certainly also promises a wholeness of body in the resurrection. The miracle that Peter performed to this man, even though we can't do that now, is a picture of what will happen on the last day. See, Peter says that times of restoration might come. Oh, sorry. He says that times of refreshing might come. And then he says 
the, that God spoke to the mouths of holy prophets, the time for the restoring of all things. This man was restored to perfect health. Now, since Christ is an unburnable bridge through which we can always retreat in repentance and in whom we can always find the forgiveness of our sins through his death and resurrection, we can cross over by him to eternal life, to the restoration of all things. You know, to restore something means to bring it back, to repair it to its original condition. I don't know if any of you guys are into old cars or old houses or anything like that. I don't really care that much about cars, but I, I, I kind of like watching some of those HGTV shows sometimes, and they see some old, broken-down house, you're like, that thing's a piece of garbage. You just th destroy that. But some people have, have an eye to see what's underneath, to see what could be restored, what could be made right, made beautiful again. Sometimes a relationship needs restoration. When two people have been separated for a while, maybe because of distance or because one of them burned a bridge in one way or another, and it takes time, it takes work to restore that back to what it was before. This world is in desperate need of restoration. We look around and, and we can see glimpses of the beauty that's there. Quite a bit of it. The world is still a wonder and a marvel of the creative work of God. But it is also terribly scarred and corrupted. If there's something wrong. And everybody knows it. Which is interesting, right? Because... Most people don't know how they know it. Everybody realizes there's something wrong. They look around, there's pain, there's death, there's sin, there's sickness, there's sorrow. Why? But unless they believe in the God of the Bible, they have no answer to that question, and they don't even know why they know there's something wrong. Take the evolutionist, the atheist. There is no reason in the world why he or she should think that there's anything wrong with this world. Death? That's how life came to be. According to evolution, murder, crime, survival of the fittest, kill or be killed, it's all par for the course. If evolution is true, that's the way things have always been, and that's the way things always will be. He has no reason for suggesting that there's something wrong in this world, and yet he does. In fact, those are always the same people who try to claim that the wrongness in the world proves that God doesn't exist. You can't have it both ways. There is something wrong. We all know it. Everybody sees it because everybody hears the creation groaning, as the Bible says. It's been groaning ever since Adam and Eve fell into sin and subjected creation to corruption beneath their sinful, guilty weight. And this is the aim of Christ's work, to restore all things. Peter teaches this is the purpose of Christ's coming in our text. He tells the Jews to repent that their sins might be blotted out and that times of refreshing might come like a cool breeze on a hot day or a drink of cold lemonade after you've been out sweating and working. Today a refreshing thing would probably be more like a nice hot breeze rather than a cool one. He says, and that God might send to you the Christ appointed for you. Well, you might think, well, he already did, right? And that's part of the point. Christ already has come. God already sent the Christ to them, and they rejected and denied him. Peter's saying he's going to come again. You get a second chance. Because before he comes again, now you have time to repent and to believe. Hebrews 9 says it like this, that Christ will come a second time apart from sin for salvation. Apart from sin because he already dealt with sin. And notice a second time, only two times. He's only coming two times. Don't listen to the millennials. I mean, it's not the millennials, the, the millennialists. It's a difference there. He came once to die and to rise, and he's coming again in glory and judgment and for salvation for those who believe in him. And in between, this gospel message is spread throughout the world like a healing potion spreading through the body, a cure. And that's what's happening. That's what God is waiting for. As the gospel spreads to every land so that everybody that he has called and chosen for faith might believe in him, then he will come to restore all things. The prophets of the Old Testament, they viewed these two as kind of the same, beginning and end of the same work, of the same day, of the same story. They often foretell the first coming and the second coming of Christ in the same breath. And notice how Peter draws a connection between these things in our text. He says, 
that Christ's suffering was foretold by the mouth of all the prophets, and then that the times of the restoration of all things were foretold, he says, of which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from long ago. By raising Christ from the dead, God was saying, declaring, that everything foretold that Christ would do in his first coming had been done. And promising that everything that Christ had yet to do would be done. He was telling us what it was all for, to restore us in perfect glory and joy, to restore the world in perfect peace and beauty, to restore our relationship with him to sweet, close communion and love. You know, I said, I, I can't always see you know, what other people see in some broken down house or some old car. And in the same way, none of us can really see what God sees in this broken down, corrupted world. We can't even begin to imagine or to describe how beautiful, how wonderful that new creation will be. We can't even begin to imagine what joy awaits us there. But we do know this, and I can declare this to you, that there is a way there. There is a bridge to that restoration, and it is Jesus Christ, the unburnable bridge. Since he was crucified for us and since the Father raised him from the dead, we know that we can always retreat from sin and repentance and come to his cross and empty grave to find forgiveness of all of our sins. And we know that we can finally cross over through him the only way to the perfectly restored creation. Ah, how refreshing that will be. Amen. Please rise.